Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Detection of SARS-CoV-2 Antibodies Using an Innovative Approach, Dried Blood Spots Offer the Possibility of Home-Based Self-Collection. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin. To learn more, visit diasorin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker. Dr. Carmen L. Charlton, PhD, Board Certified Clinical Microbiologist, Clinical Director, Diasorin. Dr. Charlton, you may now begin your presentation. Well, thank you very much for having me today. I'm excited to talk to you about what we've been doing with dry blood spots and uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So I'll do a little bit of background for myself first. Uh, I'm a board certified clinical microbiologist and I've been working in public health for nearly 10 years now. Uh, my kind of domain, we do about 2 million tests per year to give you an idea of what we test is uh, environmental water testing, enteric disease, uh, things like outbreak investigations. We also do immunity testing, including SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, uh, mycobacteriology, uh, mycology and parasitology. We also look at transplant virology, zoonotic diseases, uh, and emerging pathogen testing. So we have a very wide base of different tests that we do at public health. And uh, my program lead particularly is I look at HIV, hepatitis, prenatal screening, and most recently COVID serology. I am an associate professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology and clinical director at Test and Travel. And I work with a number of different research institutes, including the Lee Cushing Institute for Virology. And I'm a member of the Canadian National COVID Serology Working Group. And I'll touch a little bit on that work uh, later on in the presentation as well. Okay, as we're all familiar with, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that causes COVID-19 infection. And here we can see an illustrated version of what the virus looks like. You have the spike protein in green, uh, which is associated with entry into the cell. There's also uh, the membrane proteins, which are around the edges. You can see the nucleocapsid, and the nucleocapsid is going to be important when we talk a little bit more about antibodies, uh, antibody generation a little bit later on. And then interior to the virus is the RNA, which is detected by PCR mechanisms. So what we'll be looking at for SARS-CoV-2 serology is really the spike protein primarily. And the spike protein is responsible for binding to the ACE2 uh, receptor on cells, so in your body cells. And this is going to be the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And when those two make contact, it basically allows internalization of the virus and then infection. What we want with an immune response are neutralizing antibodies to prevent that interaction between the ACE2 receptor and the spike protein. And when you have neutralizing antibodies, they're able to uh, prevent basically that spike protein from touching the receptor and therefore the virus is never internalized and you don't have infection. So to look at the spike protein a little bit closer. Um, it is actually the target for many of the serological assays, which makes sense because you want to know if your body is making antibodies to that spike subunit. And the targets for serological assays will look at either the whole spike protein, so the spike as well as that C-terminal uh, domain complex with the receptor binding domain, um, here labeled RBD, as well as the um, N-terminal domain, so those kind of globular tops on the spike. And some assays will look at the, just the partial spike, so just the very top part, 
And some will look at just that receptor binding domain. And the receptor binding domain is really important for making contact with that ACE2 uh, receptor and is really where it actually binds. And so many of the neutralizing antibodies that we uh, see are targeted towards that receptor binding domain because they were, they're the best at preventing that interaction between the spike and the ACE2. So for COVID-19 serology, really what we're doing is we're detecting antibodies that are specific to the virus, so SARS-CoV-2, uh, in the blood, so serum or plasma. And there's really a limited role of COVID-19 uh, diagnosis for acute infection with serology. And this is really because it takes time for the antibodies to develop. So it takes seven to 14 days after symptom onset to develop a reliable and measurable antibody response. And antibodies may not be detected at all, uh, especially in mild or asymptomatic cases. And we're still learning about what role in immunity and longevity of protection the antibodies actually have um, compared to things like cell-mediated immunity and what role antibodies play in that um, back and forth. So if we looked at this pictorially, we can see that over time, if you are exposed um, pre-symptom onset, so that dashed vertical line is your time that you would start to elicit symptoms. So before that is when you're exposed to the virus. And you can see that it's probably detection is unlikely by most, most mechanisms. The blue line that you start to see coming up first is a nasopharyngeal swab PCR. And that's probably the first thing that we detect post-symptom onset. And maybe, maybe a day before symptom onset, you can detect it as well. That rises pretty sharply, which increases the chances of detection and then falls by about week four to a fairly low level baseline. And although we know that we can detect PCR up to 30 or more days post infection or post symptom onset, the likelihood of detecting PCR is really in that first two and maybe three weeks uh, post symptom onset. Serology, on the other hand, um, takes a little bit of a lag to start being able to be detected. So between two to three weeks and probably greater than 21 days is really when you have a strong measurable antibody response. Um, IgM and IgG typically come up uh, concomitantly with one another early in infection. And then IgM then will wane, uh, which is the purple dotted line. And the IgG will be maintained longer, which is the green dotted line. Interestingly, uh, the yellow line there is stool PCR. Uh, and this one, it comes into roles when you're looking at wastewater um, responses in, in population-based studies. So because the coronavirus can be detected in stool, you can then use wastewater to look at uh, possible reemergence of when the virus is coming up. So how well can these antibodies really be detected by commercial assays? Well, we very early in the pandemic um, had the opportunity to examine a number of commercial assays as well as point of care devices to see how well they can detect these antibodies. And I know the writing is small, but basically what I want you to see as a take home is that none of the assays are very good pre two weeks uh, post and post PCR diagnosis. So all of these were PCR positive, And then later we drew serum on the individuals. And you can see that at zero to 14 days post PCR diagnosis, um, the assays are pretty bad at detecting antibodies. And this isn't really a, a detriment to the assay, but more of how your body actually makes antibodies. So there's just not a lot of antibody production in that time point. Between 15 and 21 days, the assays do get better. Um, the sensitivities go up quite a bit more, but really after 21 days is when the majority of assays are reliably detecting high levels of antibodies and showing that there is a, at least an IgG or IgM response. So early in the pandemic and now, we still get lots of questions about serology. Um, people ask, what does a positive serology mean? Well, when you look at the context of what I've just shown you, it can either mean that you've had past infection or vaccination, 
or it could be a false positive on the assay. Um, does a positive mean I'm immune? Well, that that is kind of the million dollar question right now and is something that we know not necessarily is true. And so if you have antibodies, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are immune from infection. And a lot of work is going into this right now to see if there is a cutoff value, something that we would use for say rubella or measles or mumps, something uh, that would say you're protected or you are susceptible to infection. So a lot of work is going into this right now. Uh, one thing that physicians ask quite a lot is can I order serology to diagnose acute infection? And the answer to this is no, uh, just how the antibody re response comes, you're not gonna reliably detect these up to three weeks and by then you hopefully are done with your infection. Some physicians ask if their patient was positive, can they use serology to track infection? And right now the answer for that is no. Um, a lot of assays have now come out with quantitative measures, um, but we haven't really been using this as a way to track infection. Physicians also ask, can I use serology for retrospective diagnoses? And we have allowed this in certain small situations like Miss C in children. Um, to see if they haven't had a positive PCR, then we can actually say that they have been exposed to COVID using a nucleocapsid antibody. But the utility of this is quite small. And other questions that physicians will ask is um, their patient had a negative COVID-19 PCR, but they still have symptoms. Can they use serology to diagnose infection? And well, typically true, I think clinically it's less valuable unless you are looking at something like a Miss C condition. So putting that all together, where do we really go from here? So we know that we have assays that can detect antibodies about three weeks out, um, but what does that mean? So I thought I'd share a little bit about my experience during COVID. And so I'm located uh, in the province of Alberta in Canada in that, that red boxed province. So we're uh, in Edmonton, which is fairly far north. And we have a provincial population of about 4.5 million people. And what we really wanted to know is what is the true prevalence of COVID-19 in our province? We were doing wide ranged uh, PCR testing, but we wanted to know are people not coming in for testing or are we missing people? Uh, and so really we wanted to highlight how many people are we being, are being missed for current NAT testing uh, or nucleic acid testing policies. So what we did um, is we took a residual serum approach and we wanted to see what was happening in the first two waves. So at the time the, uh, the peak in May of 2020 was really high for what we thought was high. Um, and it turns out that's just the tip of the iceberg. But basically our first COVID uh, case was seen in March of 2020. And from then we started to see quite a bit of a peak. Uh, so we started with our first restrictions in March uh, 15th of 2020, and we saw an increase in our COVID cases. The dark line, um, the dark black line is our seven day trend average for PCR positives. And then the orange bars are the number, the daily number of PCR positive cases. And so what we did for our residual stero survey is that um, from five different sites uh, in rural and two metropolitan areas, we collected specimens uh, during the gray bars. So each of those vertical gray bars is a time that we collected uh, five days worth of specimens essentially from those areas to try to get a better idea what was happening in our population. And so you can see that we missed the first wave, but we did um, track across the second wave uh, to look for antibody positivity. And what we found was that age groups early on in the pandemic showed different prevalence levels. So one thing that was really interesting to us is the top graph for zero to nine years, because we essentially had very few or no uh, PCR positives in this age range. And yet our prevalence levels by antibody were quite high. And so this was one of the first indications that we were seeing a lot of asymptomatic um, infection in our kids.
And in the older age ranges, the prevalence for PCR, especially for um, 80 plus, where we were doing high levels of PCR testing, were very concordant with what we were seeing with the PCR. So we weren't really missing very many cases by testing by PCR in those age categories, but we were definitely missing cases in the zero to nine year category. So this graph um, combines our knowledge of the nucleic acid testing to serology testing. So basically, once there was a PCR positive, that was our time zero. And then along the bottom axis is the weeks from that first PCR. So we knew that um, when the serologies were drawn, they how, how much time they were out from that first PCR. And we can see that the antibodies really were able to still be detected 40 weeks out from infection. And the drop by 40 weeks is just the number of samples we had that far out from PCR, not necessarily the number of them that we were being detected. Um, so we can still see that the IgG positives, uh, the black bars are still positive in that 40 week range. Um, but we are still seeing some negatives or we're seeing a higher proportion of negatives at that, that point, time point. The other thing that's interesting is that we're seeing a lot of negatives very early on in infection, which really backs up what we saw earlier of the assays not being able to detect antibodies before three weeks post-infection. So when can serology really be useful? Well, I think the main thing is really for these seroprevalence studies. I think they give a really good idea of what's happening in your population. And it also can help public health measures um, to put in, you know, maybe your antibody levels are declining. Maybe that might be a better time for vaccination. Um, I think a clinical indication that still remains helpful for serology is MIS-C. Um, which is the multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, occasionally, when you see unusual neurologic or uh, thrombocytopenic events or embolic events, excuse me, COVID serology can also help there. Uh, and things like COVID toes that other viruses can cause too, but maybe you don't have a PCR diagnosis on file, you can uh, use serology to help diagnose for those ones as well. But I think the main thing for serology is really these seroprevalence studies to look at a population-based sampling rather than individual clinical cases. So I was able to um, work with the um, Canadian Immunity Task Force Serology Working Group and very early in the pandemic, we were kind of tasked to guide recommendations for Canada of how we should be using these serological tasks. And so we um, essentially came together, uh, one designate per province at least, um, to put together how we should structure these algorithms for testing, who should be tested, what recommendations we should make. And this is really, um, because serology has limited diagnostic capacity for acute infection and its role in providing that population-based information on positivity rates and informing those evidence-based decisions for public health recommendations was really increasing at the time. So because vaccines were also coming out at the same time, there was this increasing pressure on clinical labs to provide antibody screening and result interpretation for vaccinated and non-vaccinated individuals. What was available by the assays was, or by the different companies for their assays was changing quite rapidly. And so basically we had put together a guidance on how to verify these commercial assays and then choose appropriate testing algorith algorithms based on the local population. So I've talked about these different residual studies um, and how they can really help for public health managers. But one thing that we, very quickly identified is, are all populations represented? And unfortunately, the answer to this is no, um, even within our residual study. And so when we look at our residual study, we tested um, basically the five rural sites and two um, metro sites. So Grand Prairie is one of our rural sites, as well as Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and Red Deer, um, Calgary and Edmonton being our metropolitan areas. 
but you can see there's a huge section of Alberta in gray, which is termed rural. So it's further away from these testing centers. And while we use Grand Prairie, for example, as a catchment area for more rural areas, if somebody is living in Northern Alberta, it can take them hours and hours to get to drive to Grand Prairie for a blood collection. And so we are likely missing a fairly significant portion of our population because they don't have as direct access to care or they're not in the catchment areas for our more rural sites that we used in the residual sero survey. And when we put all these data together, we saw very quickly that our rural sites, which is the gray bar on the very bottom of all of these, was quickly increasing. So in June, the rural positivity was less than 5%, uh, less than 1% actually. Uh, in September, it went up to about 2.5%. And then in November, it also increased to about 3%. And this is um, much higher seroprevalence than the urban cities compared to the amount of representation that we were getting in them. Uh, and so there was likely a lot more positivity in the rural areas than what we were picking up just based on how we were collecting samples. But underserved uh, populations are really hard to reach. So a lot of serology studies, including ours, um, are performed on individuals with easy access to care. Those residual specimens that we got were from other testing for people who were directly accessing care. And so if you had any barriers to care, um, if you were in a rural population, a marginalized population, or another barrier to care, you're not going to be included in this um, seroprevalence survey. So to include these populations, you really need an easy to use collection method. Um, and preferably one that doesn't really need a trained healthcare provider to implement because we already know the challenges of getting out to these rural sites and getting specimens collected from the rural sites. So I guess there's a couple different options. One would be to allow point of care serology testing to those areas. And we were able to evaluate a number of different point of care assays uh, when they first came out in early 2020. And just like the larger commercial assays, they were very poor at detecting antibodies um, before three weeks of infection. But post three weeks, they're actually pretty good. Um, and if you combine their IgM and IgG scores, a lot of them had a sensitivity of 100% for the samples that we tested. So this would be a possibility. Um, the challenge with these ones is then training people to do them, um, getting you know, either a CLIA wave test to get into those areas or extending your umbrella to um, more rural providers to do it. So it's a lot more challenging to get the point of care serology testing out. And then the other option is to use a dried blood spot. So samples can be collected at home. The results are more standardized because the tests themselves are actually performed in a laboratory. And the sample collection is relatively easy um, because you can ship dried blood spot spots through regular mail and they're considered non-infectious that makes an easy transport system and the cost is way lower lo excuse me way lower than if you use phlebotomy so i'll focus on a study that was done um, across canada um, and this was performed by the national lab where they used um, 10 commercial and two in-house developed tests to assess SARS-CoV-2 antibody detection and what they did is they took 10 known positives and 10 known negative um, samples and they reconstituted it with red blood cells to create the dried blood spots. They then shipped those dried blood spots to different labs in Canada um, and those different labs performed the testing and sent the data back to the National Microbiology Lab to analyze. So the, a couple of them were really good. So the Euromune, the Alexa Spike, and the GSP Delphia had 100% sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. So they actually performed very well. Um, some of the larger uh, commercial assays, like the Liaison, the Architect, and the Siemens, the Cove2, Cove2G assay, they had um, a pretty good specificity and positive predictive value but very low sensitivity, so less than 20% um, and less than 55% for the negative predictive value. 
Now, there is a caveat for this study that they say that they did actually not perform any optimization. They basically just took a protocol, used that same protocol for all of the different assays uh, and to see how they would perform. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but I just wanted to show how the assays compared to one another. So you can see um, in the second column, it has DBS punches. So that's basically the amount of specimen that they were putting into their dilutions. Um, the uremune and the platella um, have two punches, and these are um, plate-based assays, so they would require less input of volume, whereas the liaison, the Siemens, the Roche, um, the Abbott, et cetera, all needed four punches to really get a higher level of specificity and positive predictive value. But unfortunately, the liaison at 10% and the architect at 20% sensitivity really were not performing well. Um, in addition to the Siemens was also at 10%. So it seems like the larger assays or the commercial based assays that require a larger volume input were a little bit unfairly um, degraded in their sensitivity, probably because there was a higher dilution factor, even though you're using um, four punches for them, uh, just because you have a dead volume in these instruments. And so I think DBS is really uh, an okay sample type to use. Uh, you just have to optimize your instruments. So the other question that we had is really, how good is at-home collection for these dry blood spots? And there was a paper that was published um, fairly recently in 2022 by Mies et al. And they looked at um, at-home collection of dry blood spots specifically for um, COVID antibodies. And basically what they would do is they would send this card um, to their volunteers who were participating in the study. They would then spot five spots, uh, let it dry, pop it in a biohazard bag, and then they would mail it to the lab. Once it's in the lab, the lab would punch out um, a hole, they would then dilute that punch, and then they would test it on the instrument. So what they found is that for their assay, they were looking at, um, for their punches, a PCR-based assay. And they actually found that uh, both the negative predictive value, the positive predictive value were very good, and the sensitivity was also um, quite good with the um, PCR-based diagnostics. And they did a review of a bunch of different other studies as well, including venous plasma antibody measurements. And when you compare um, an at-home collection versus a healthcare-provided collection, they were essentially equivalent in their ability to detect the antibodies. And so I think this at-home collection does bring testing more direct to the patient because they can do it at home. It's equivalent to a healthcare provider doing the testing and they can send it in the mail, something that maybe they would have to drive two or three hours in our case for people living very rur rurally remote um, to a phlebotomy center. So they don't have to go to a phlebotomy center now and can just mail in their dry blood spots. So we wanted to tackle um, the problem of having those very reduced sensitivities in the higher, higher volume commercial based assays. And so what we wanted to do um, is an optimization of dried blood spots on the liaison, the diasaurin instrument. So we looked at two different things. We did contrived blood spots just like they did in the National Microbiology Laboratory study. Um, and what we did uh, is fairly similar to what they had, is that we had residual serum and plasma samples that we had previously tested for um, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, so we knew what the results should be. And we mixed those one-to-one -one with red blood cells to essentially recreate a whole blood scenario. We took 75 microliters of that and we spotted onto five different spots on our dried blood spot. And we allowed those cars to dry for two hours in a biosafety hood. And then we stored them at room temperature for seven days um, in a biohazard bag with a desiccant. Now, I think that it's really important that um, we left them out for seven days because we wanted to test if those cards are gonna be robust enough to make it through the mail system. Uh, and sometimes 
from very rural sites, it takes a long time for even Canada Post to get to um, the laboratory. So we want to make sure that those cards could sit at room temperature at least uh, and still be stable and give us good results. So we have results up to uh, now three weeks out and they're um, essentially equivalent to the seven days. So we know that the dried blood spots at room temperature are very robust and can be left out um, for a long period of time. The other thing that we wanted to look at is whole blood dried blood spot um, because this is really the sample type that we would actually be getting. It's just a harder sample type to get because you need volunteers to donate both blood and um, a dried blood spot at the same time to really make a good evaluation. So we did find those volunteers and they donated blood. Um, so we did a paired dried blood spot as well as a serum for testing. So the whole blood was spotted onto the dried blood spot um, prior to spinning the tube where we collected the serum. And then we stored the serum samples at four degrees until they were tested. And the dried blood spot samples were again, just like in the contrived blood spots, were allowed to dry in the biosafety cabinet. And then we stored them for at least seven days prior to testing. So a few things that we did for optimization, we took 10 or 15 rather of our um, contrived dried blood spot samples to use in the optimization. So 10 positives and five negatives. And we varied our incubation times, we varied our shaking times. Um, so we looked at 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. And we also looked at the volume of sample diluent. So we looked at 200 microliters with two spots, 300 with two spots, 600 with four, and 1,000 with four spots. And we also looked at the ways to extract the dried blood spots from the sample. So one, one way we used, we cut up the strips uh, with scissors and put them into the tube. And the other way, which the techs vastly preferred, was that you put the dried blood spot paper over the top of your tube that you're using, and then you use a one mil pipette just to pop the whole dried blood spot into the tube. That um, is easier because you just use a disposable tip and you can throw it away. You don't have to clean the scissors in between. And it's a one step action rather than very laboriously snipping up that dried blood spot into the tube. So we quickly found out that there was a trade-off in sensitivity when you had higher volumes, but it was very difficult to remove small volumes from the filter paper because it would just suck up the small volumes uh, and you'd have to kind of use the side of your pipette to try to wring out the volume from the filter paper. So we did re run into a few problems getting that diluent out. And so we tried centrifuging uh, at first, but the filter paper is very absorptive and it would just reconstitute or um, absorb the liquid essentially before you could get it out of the centrifuge. And so you're basically wringing it out with the side of pipette tip, um, which the text did not really like. But one thing that did really work for us is that we used um, Kaijin spin columns and we put the dried blood spots on the top and spun them down and then the diluent was there. So that, that actually worked even with lower levels of um, diluent that was initially added. So our validation design of contrived blood, dried blood spot samples, we had 30 high positives, 10 mid-range positives and 10 low positives. And we had 50 samples. So what we found was that these are the 30 high positive samples. And um, the red, which you can't really see very often, is this um, 280, which is the maximum amount uh, that we that I used in this um, study without the, the auto dilution on the diasorin. So this is uh, 2080 um, binding antibody units per mil. And that's gonna be the maximum um, that we see. And I kind of, moved all the other assays to the same level just so you can kind of see a better comparison. So the Diasorin serum of the contrived blood spots is basically at the max for all of these samples. And the blue is the, or sorry, the serum is at the max. The blue is the dried blood spot, which you can see kind of drops uh, on a few of them, but is really over 1300 for all of them. The other two colors that you see on here are the Abbott uh, receptor binding domain, so it's a little bit lower, but again, the uh, diasorin is a trimeric assay, so it's looking at three different components of the spike protein, 
whereas the Abbott is the receptor binding domain. And then finally in yellow is the gen script, which is looking for neutralizing antibodies. So just as a reminder, um, again, the DSRN assay, you have the three antibodies that can bind. So you're probably going to see a higher quantitation of these ones. This is what we're likely seeing. And then for the Abbott assay, it's specifically a receptor binding domain. So it's that much smaller yellow section of the spike protein. And then um, finally, for neutralizing antibody, I just wanted to go over that. Uh, again, the neutralizing antibodies are going to be the antibodies that are going to stop the interaction between the spike protein and that ACE2 receptor. And so typically these are done by plaque reduction neutralization uh, assays. Um, they're high sensitivity and specificity, but they have limited throughput um, and they're highly specialized. But in our case, we actually used a new gen script assay, which gives a quantitative um, function of neutralizing antibodies. And that's how we um, have the yellow bars here. So if we look at this again, this is a zoom in of what we saw for the high, high positive antibodies. Uh, serum is red here all the way across the board. The dried blood spots do fall a little bit in blue, but we're seeing an increased decrease of the architect IgG, our RBD in gray, as well as the gen script for the neutralizing antibodies, which makes sense because there's probably fewer neutralizing antibodies than total antibodies in the serum. Finally, we looked at um, low and mid positives. This is contrived blood dried blood spots versus serum. And you can see that the gen script has fairly good neutralizing antibodies in the yellow, uh, consistent with the serum, which is in the red for the DSRN. And if we compare that to the blue, which is the dried blood spots, there's definitely a, a decrease in what you're seeing for the dried blood spots, but it's still above what you're seeing with the Abbott RBD. So if we pull out uh, just the DSRN testing, you can see that the serum is consistently at the high mark with slight decreases of the dried blood spots for those high samples. Um, but again, they're all above 1300, so they're very, very high and um, basically 100% concordant in a categorical agreement. And again, here is the same for the serum in red and the dried blood spots in blue, you can really see that there is a decrease in what you're seeing for the dried blood spots. But if you look at even the very low positive samples, these are still concordant, even though they have very low values. So again, showing that dried blood spots can still pick up even those low values um, when you have contrived specimens. So we also looked at the whole blood uh, dried blood spots. So here we had 10 volunteers. Uh, all the volunteers were triple vaccinated and two of them actually had COVID-19 infection after vaccination and our age range was 23 to 60 years old. So this is what we found. Um, samples one and seven were triple vaccinated and had breakthrough infections, so they have higher levels of antibodies, um, not unexpectedly. And some of the volunteers who only had vaccination and no infection, um, four and five have much lower antibody levels than what we would anticipate. But even five who had um, by the serum, which in here is, is blue, uh, very low levels of antibodies, we were still able to pick that up by dried blood spot, um, which is, is really good for the assay. So overall, dried blood spot was 100% concordant with serum samples on the DSRN liaison. And the quantitative value was lower on the dried blood spot compared to serum um, in the contrived samples. So in high positive samples, we saw less of a decrease. They were basically 93% of high positives. Uh, in the mid range, we saw about 50% decrease and in the low positives, we thought 37%. But if you're looking for just a qualitative yes, no for antibodies, it's still 100% concordant with what we were seeing in serum. And then finally, for the quantitative value for dried blood spots in the whole blood samples, we saw an average decrease of about 55%. So for practical uses of dried blood spots, I think this is really helpful for remote settings where phlebotomy access is difficult. Um, and this is a large portion of our province and we have this problem for basically every test to try to get people access to care.
Uh, I really think that this might be a very interesting thing for research studies looking at seroprevalence because you would be able to access a lot larger population base and maybe get a better idea of what the true prevalence for antibodies is. Uh, you may want to include a conversion factor if you're assessing a quantitative value because we know that these are trending to be about 55% of the total volume, uh, value for serum compared to dry blood spot. But I really think that you can use these to understand the prevalence in the population and that's maybe where the power of these ones lie. So with that, I will um, thank you for listening to the presentation and I will take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Charlton, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, did the Alberta Sero survey data you presented make any impact to public health measures? So yes, it did actually. So I'm just gonna go back to that slide quickly to, um, to show you again. Um, so this uh, is kind of the snapshot of the first two waves. And so with our Sero survey data, because we were able to give this essentially in real time to public health, they were able to use this to um, help them identify when boosters should be given to the population. And when we start, started to see our antibodies declining, that's when they started to push booster vaccination. And so I think that this has definitely helped public health measures from that respect. Uh, and we continue to do this data because it is helpful for public health to understand what's happening in our local population. Thank you. Next question, can you comment on the quality and variability of collected DBS in testing? So yes, I think that was that's one of a really important question that um, the at-home collection is really thought to be inferior, maybe as a first pass than a healthcare provided collection. Um, but in fact, that's kind of the opposite, that's what's what has been found is because a lot of people who are doing at-home collections are very um, engaged and they read the instructions very well and you get um, very good sampling. Now that's not to say that all of them are exactly perfect, but you do get a very good sampling and at least equivalent to what you would get if a healthcare worker were to do the sampling for you. So I think that dried blood spots at home still are a really good um, possibility, especially when you think about uh, the access to care issues or barriers to care for a lot of individuals. Thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question. Because there is a drop in quantitation for DBS, how do you see DBS working in research and clinical settings? Uh, thank you for that question. I, I, I think that, um, the drop that we see in the whole blood samples especially is um, probably more like what you would see in a real life scenario. And so I think it is possible that you would be able to come up with a conversion factor of a dried blood spot quantitative level compared to a serum level. And if you were able to have that quantitation level, and it might not be um, a linear quantitation, it might be something similar to what we were seeing that you know, a high positive has about 93% of what you would see in serum, whereas a lower positive, you're only seeing about 37% or so. I think that might be similar to what we would see with the whole blood. But I think if you could have that conversion factor, you could very easily transition into something that you would have seen with a phlebotomy draw and a serum sample. Thank you, Dr. Charlton. Do you have any final comments for our audience? No, I just wanted to say thank you again for uh, letting me present. I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Charlton, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Diasorin, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions.
questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye.